In this video, we're going to show you a way of laying out the Wheel of Life as a mandala. The Wheel of Life is one of the three great archetypes. It is also called the Medicine Wheel, Wheel of Fortune, Zodiac or Chakra. It contains within it all wisdom. Mandala is a Sanskrit word meaning square and circle. The circle represents the spiritual world, the square represents the natural world. That is to say, spirit and body. Their interface and marriage creates the soul. As we make the mandala, we square the circle. As we do this, it also operates in three dimensions. In effect, we cube the sphere. Creating the mandala or wheel of life in the appropriate way reveals the wisdom in the wheel of life and also the life process we use to build the mandala. Such a mandala is an energy form and a focus of beauty and corrects energy imbalances in the environment. In this example, we should be building it on a table in a room. I will explain the process and some of what it means as we go along. The mandala is created in, four, uh, in a process with four stages, which represents the life process. And the first stage is preparation. And it's always good to make as good a preparation as you can. So first of all, you find the place where you want to lay out your mandala or wheel of life. You usually find a heart centre in a room or in a, a landscape or whatever you feel is appropriate as, as your focal point. So you just choose it carefully. And then you prepare all the other things you need to do, the, um, yourself, the things you're going to use in the mandala, or be aware of what's in the environment you might not like to collect from nature for it. And when you, when you finish that preparation, then you start the second stage of building the mandala. So I can't emphasize this more than what I've just said, really. The preparation is a stage of building the mandala. You've already started building it once you start preparing. And preparation is like a seed. The plants that it grows into with its fruit will only be as good as the seed was in the very beginning. So it gives you an idea of how important preparation is. So once you are prepared, the next stage begins with marking the centre. And how we usually mark it is with a candle, which can be lit um, in a bowl of water and flowers. So you put that exactly at the centre. You mark the centre. You mark the heart. Something like that. And then if you've got a group of people uh, between you, you would determine if, if everybody agrees that that is exactly in the right spot. Now the centerpiece could be very simple. Um, when people founded a temple, for instance, usually the hierophant or bishop came along with a stick. And when he found the right place, he plunged the stick into the ground and it made the vertical axis at that point. And that would mark the heart of the building. And then the whole building was laid out from that in a geometric way, uh, finding the right orientation and so on. Um, here, because we're using a room, we've chosen to do it this way. Also, it's symbolic in its own right. You have the idea of the two polarities, heaven and earth, or male and female, coming together in a love marriage. So you have the candle in the bowl, a very powerful symbol of male and female coming together in a love relationship. But in addition, you also have the alchemical symbolism. When the candle's lit, it will produce a flame. Um, and then you've got the flowers, which is a symbol of the air element, sitting in water, which is a water element, sitting in a bowl um, of glass in this instance, which is a symbol of the earth element. So you actually have the symbol of all four alchemical elements, earth, water, air, fire, which the same elements represent the four stages of the life process and the four quarters of the wheel of life or mandala that we're going to lay out. This, this itself is wisdom, because from the one come the three. This, this, is, this is a sacred law. The one cannot manifest without polarity, and as soon as you have polarity, you have the relationship between the two, which is the trinity. So the four is produced by the one becoming three. And this, this is a law which, which underlies all life. 
once you've marked the center like this, then the next stage is to light the candle, of course, and to make a dedication. The dedication is really a statement of purpose, but stating the purpose in such a way that you're dedicating it to whatever you want, but um, hopefully you'll dedicate it to something good. That's the idea of all this. <laughs> so I'm going, I am going to dedicate this candle to the all good. May all life grow towards it and express it in all the ways of joy and beauty it can discover. So the marking the center and the lighting of the candle starts off the second stage, which is called laying out the foundation. The candle itself, I ought to remark on, is a wonderful symbol of the alchemical elements and perhaps why they were chosen in the first place, to mark these four great stages that life goes through in order to produce light. So you have the hard wax of the candle, which then melts when heat is applied to it, producing a liquid wax. Then it um, goes into a vapour, rising up the wick, and then that vapour can burst into flame, and the flame shines with light. So you have the idea of hard wax as the earth element, liquid wax the water element, the vapour wax is the air element, and the flame is the fire element, and the flame shines with light. So it's a wonderful symbol of the process of life when it's working perfectly, which can produce light. Well, that's a physical symbol, but it's the same is true of our psyche, where we can produce illumination in ourselves by going through the life process in the right way. Well, as we build the mandala, we're going to follow that life process. Now, to lay out the foundation, as it's called, from the center, is to mark the main directions of space and create a circle because the one first thing that the center does is to express itself as a circle just like a pebble falling into water produces circles of ripples going out from the center again this is, this is a expression of the law of life in how it operates so as we make the circle of this mandala we're actually expressing what's hidden in the center there when we start to make the circle, the first direction we mark for it, or the place on the circle that will be the starting point, is always the north. So it's important to try to choose the right orientation of north. There are several choices always. If you're in a natural landscape, you can choose the north point of the earth, geographic north. Um, but if you're in a room, unless the room is orientated with its walls directly north, south, east, west, um, if, if that's not the case, then the wall that's nearest to the north direction would be your north wall. So you can choose that accordingly. But there is another pattern too, which is often um, more powerful to use, and that is if you find a chakra system in a room, the crown chakra is always considered the north point, and the root chakra is always the south point. Same thing in ourselves, the crown chakra is our north and the root chakra is our south pole. So the kind of place in a room would be a crown chakra would be your, uh, your main focus of the room. Um, very often in older houses it's a fireplace, um, some, something that is rather beautiful. In a church, of course, it's the high altar at the east end. So that's the north point in terms of chakra system, but a church is usually orientated towards the east, so it's using um, a, a double pattern of orientation there. For this form of the mandala, which we use, we mark out the main directions, north, east, south, west, with the symbols of the alchemical elements. And the, we, we mark them out in the fundamental way as how the life process works or the candle burns in terms of turning the wheel, uh, which is also a movement clockwise around the circle, which is the way the sun moves around or appears to move around the sky in the Northern Hemisphere. So it's called sunwise movement. 
This is not the only way uh, to lay out a mandala or wheel of life or medicine wheel. But this, as far as we know, is the most fundamental way and it links everything together in a comprehensive way. So we mark the north with the symbol of earth, we mark the east with the symbol of water, we mark the south with the symbol of air, and we mark the west with the symbol of fire. The starting point is always the north. The north is known as the alpha omega point. Light is always born out of darkness, and the north in the northern hemisphere is associated with the place of darkness. And in the cycle of time, it's associated with midwinter and the moment of the birth of the new year out of that darkness, which is celebrated in the Christian calendar by, by Christmas. So I have here with me um, a lovely rock stone from a sacred mountain in New Mexico. And I'm going to use this to mark the North Point. This is the first symbol that's being laid down to mark the circle. And this is critical because all the other symbols are going to have to balance and harmonize with this. So how I place this and where I place it and what I choose as the symbol will set the tone for everything else in the mandala. So this is an important choice of whoever does this. Um, it's important to choose it right and appropriately and then to place it in the, in the position that feels the best. Here I'm going to place it at this point but if you're working with a group of people, it's good to have everyone involved in deciding then whether it should come closer to the center, which would make a smaller mandala, or of course further away, make a bigger mandala. But the distance away from the center makes a difference to the effect that it's going to have. I'm going to choose this. And, um, and if there's agreement from everybody else, then that can stay there. But we usually make a rule that whoever places down the symbol has the final say in where exactly it should be after having listened to everybody else, else's opinion. It should also be orientated as accurately as possible. So here I've chosen as accurately as I can the north direction um, of this room and this table. So if you just for a moment, just have a look at what you think this has done to the table and the space. Something has happened as soon as that is laid down. It affects our psyche, affects our consciousness, and it's affecting the energy patterns in the room. And as we build up the mandala, this will carry on, going through these phases of energy changes which affects our consciousness. The next direction to lay out is the south direction, so as to balance the north. So we make the balance across the centre. And the symbol of the south is the air element. So I'm going to ask Sarah to place a symbol of the air element. In this case, we've chosen a bird symbol with, with um, feathers because they fly in the air, a peacock. And she's placing it as accurately as she, as she can in, in the south. I'm suggesting she goes slightly towards her to get it right. And then I think that's right. And if she's happy, it can stay there. And then we have the balance. Good, so now you can see the axis marked, the north-south axis. And you can see, or maybe feel from this picture, what it's done to this space. Obviously, one of the things it's done is to create an axis. Um, and an orientation. But another thing it does is divide the space into two, into two halves, like, like a polarity. So clearly, you know, we have to go on further to create a balance and harmony of this whole table. The next place to mark is the east point with a symbol of water. So for this, I'm going to use this lovely shell and fill it with some water. So I place that down as accurately as I can, same distance from the centre as the other elements, and at right angles to that first axis to get that east point. Again, if you've got a group of people, they can all help you place it correctly. So you can experiment with coming further in or further out until you get it just right. With a table like this, it's pretty easy to do it, but if you're in an open space, 
or large floor area, then it's much, much more difficult to get it accurate. So having placed it like that, I pour water in it so we've got the natural symbol there. And then again, just feel, just see and feel what this has done to the space. And you may sense it's given a sense of weight onto one side, sort of overbalancing, or some people see an arrow shooting in, in one direction. Um, but again, it's not balanced until we put in uh, the symbol on the other side to mark the west, which Sarah is now going to do. Here's the symbol of fire in the west going on a point that will balance the water. And now at this point, we have the four main directions of space created, giving you the, what's called the upright cross or St. George's cross or the red cross. And this is nice in itself. It's a, it's a good foundation. It feels steady, but there's, you probably can see there's actually no movement there, no circle actually defined. We're still working with a square and the cross axes. So it needs something more. So now we, we actually mark the quarter directions, northeast, southeast, southwest and northwest. And the first quarter direction to mark is in the northeast. Why we choose these phases of starting off um, marking these and making the balance across the centre, why we choose the north, then the east, and then the northeast is because it's understood the main um, inpouring of energy always comes from the east or the north direction, and the receptive parts of the compass are in the south and in the west. This is, this is an ancient knowledge and ancient science, but you can experiment with it if you like until you find out whether you agree with that or not. But this is the traditional way of doing it. It's easier at this stage, until you've got more experience making a mandala, to actually choose the same symbols for each of the quarter directions. In this instance, we're choosing one of these small candles in a, in a glass holder. Uh, that looks like a star shape. So I'm going to place down the first one in the northeast as accurately as I can in the northeast and the same distance from the centre as the other main symbols. And Sarah, I hope, will tell me whether she agrees with this. So I'm going to go out a bit, she asks. And then she's going to come in and mark the southwest to balance the northeast. Come in a bit. Probably a bit more in. When you've got a lot of people here, they, they, they can all help to get it exactly right. Then the next one to put down is the southeast. Balanced by the northwest. And if you've really got it right, you'll find that those four points, quarter direction points, make a square between them. And there should be another square between your first four elements of the main directions. And so you've got a double square there, which actually gives, if you join up the the symbols, you'd have an octagon. And this is the first time, once you've got eight points marked like this, you can probably see yourself, this is the first moment in time that the, that the circle appears defined and you might feel energy starting to move in this mandala. If you use just seven, it doesn't work. Five, six, seven, doesn't work. As soon as you have eight, you have this magical connection between them all that makes a circle and starts the energy moving round the circle in that way. In other words, turning the wheel. And this, this is the moment of squaring the circle. You've got these, this double square and a circle appearing like that, like, like magic in a way. 
with, the, with this number eight done in this way. The number eight is, is, a, is a special number. It's, it's the symbol of infinity, symbol of the Holy Spirit or Holy Breath. Um, it's the symbol of Mercury, not just the planet Mercury, but the divine Mercury, which is um, a name for the word of God. Mar from Markeru, the Egyptian Markeru, meaning true word, Mercury. Um, in church symbolism, the, the font and the pulpit, for instance, uh, are traditionally octagonal shapes to give the idea of the two baptisms, baptism by water and baptism by holy breath. Um, always using this, this number eight, which makes, creates the wheel, unites square and circle together, un a symbol of uniting heaven and earth together. Very, very special. It's the foundation of the whole mandala and it actually expresses the foundations, the foundation of the universe with the basic laws, laws of life, which are there. We can't do anything about them. If we disagree with them, too bad. We, we have to live with those laws and, um, and try to enhance them, work with them in a good way. And this will take us to the second stage of the mandala, which is called beautifying. Having finished the second stage of building mandala, which is laying out the foundation, which expresses the basic laws of the cosmos or universe, uh, we then go on to the beautifying stage. Now the beautifying stage is very linked with humanity and human free will. In terms of the cosmic laws that are the foundation of the universe, we don't have free will, the cosmic laws just are. But when we come to beautifying them, uh, beautifying the fabric or foundation of the universe, then we do have free will. So when we lay out this part of the mandala to beautify it, the idea is that each of us decorates it or beautifies it um, as we each want. Nobody else can tell somebody what to do or once they put down something, nobody else should move it. And we do this together as a group effort, trusting each other that we're going to produce something very beautiful like artists working together or mu musicians playing beautiful music together. And you just trust the process, trust each other. Act of love in this expression of free will. In fact, the word free is from the Sanskrit, which means loving kindness. So freedom or free will is actually something that's based on love. Freedom is the state of love, not what many people think, which is just do whatever you jolly well like in a selfish way. That's not true freedom. Freedom is acting together in a state of love to, um, to produce a, a world of, that's based on loving kindness. So free will is a will, your will working in love. So you do as you think is right, in tune with everybody else, in a very loving way, and that's the way to produce wonderful art and beautify the foundations of the universe. In this instance, we've already worked out how we're going to beautify it, but if you were going to do it, this is the moment just to let all your group uh, just beautify it as they feel best. As Sarah and I are first going to add the beauty to enhance the, the basic structure, by just emphasizing the quarter directions. We've done this so that you can see more clearly how the quarter directions define the four main quarters of this wheel of life or mandala. If you see this not just in terms of space but in terms of time as a wheel of time, then the northern quarter, where my hand is now, is the winter period. And the stone the, in the north point is marking midwinter. And then we move round here to the end of winter, beginning of spring, which, which starts round about the start of February every year. And then this quarter, second quarter of the circle, is the spring, spring season of the year. And mid-spring is is associated with the east point. Mid-spring is the spring equinox, um, where I've got this symbol of water here. And then you go on to the end of spring, uh, beginning of summer, 
which approximately is approximately the beginning of May every year, and summer begins. So this, this is the summer period here in the south, and midsummer associated with the south point, um, mark, marked here by the peacock. End of summer, beginning of autumn over here, in the southwest point, in the calendar, that's roughly the, the start of August every year. August begins the autumn, and the autumn is famous for the harvest time, of course. That's when, in the old days, school children took their holidays to bring in the harvest. It wasn't to go for a summer holiday, it was to go for an autumn, autumn labour <laughs> in, in the fields. But nowadays, people have, tend to have forgotten this, and they think they're going on their summer holidays. Actually, they've had summer already, it's finished. And, and they've gone into the autumn phase of the year. I might, should emphasise here that the seasons, uh, in terms of this time cycle, it's a mathematical cycle. These are precise moments in time to do with the movement of the Earth about the Sun and other cosmic factors like that. It's nothing to do with the weather. The weather is something that's a movable thing. Weather's affected, of course, by the seasons, but it's, it's a more fluid thing, so it's not good to judge seasons wherever you are in the world by, by weather conditions. It's a purely mathematical energy change. And once one is, gets attuned to this, you can actually feel those changes occur at those precise moments and then notice the magic that occurs in nature at those power points, the quarter day festival points. So here in the West, we have this quarter marking the autumn time of the year. And mid-autumn is the um, autumn equinox around about September the 21st to 24th. It's slightly variable each year in terms of a exact marking of time. And then this northwest point marks the end of autumn, beginning of winter. And that's the time of year, about the beginning of November. And that's, the t that's in the old calendar is when you celebrate it with a feast of thanksgiving and remembrance. Um, in the Celtic calendar, it's called Samhain, and in the, in the Christian church, it's called the Feast of All Saints and All Souls, with Halloween preceding it. It's a three-day festival. Our ancient ancestors used to celebrate all these festivals with, three day, with a three-day festival. Three-day festival every six weeks, marking every single one of these eight PowerPoints. It's very, very good psychology. And uh, I hope one day the whole world does this because then you have a three-day festival, you have a really good time, you enjoy yourself. Um, a festival is always based on a feast. Everybody loves to eat together, have it in a good way, drink together in a good way, dance, sing, do happy things. Three days of that, of love and enjoyment, and then you're ready for work for the corresponding weeks that follow. It's good psychology, it's a good energy, healing, and, um, and it's good for the world. Now, before we go further with the beautifying, I want to say a bit more about the four quarters of the circle. Besides marking the seasons of a time cycle, whether it's an annual cycle or a bigger cycle or a smaller one, there's always these four quarters to it and these eight power points. The eight power points, I should say, are the where one quarter changes into the next or the midpoints where the power of that quarter or season is at its maximum. Where the season changes from one to another, or the quarter changes from one to another, the, the crossover is a kind of fluid feeling because one quarter or season merges slightly into another. So because this is marked by the Sorta cross or St Andrew's cross in the circle, this is associated with the feminine principle, which is traditionally seen as more fluid than the masculine one. So in, in the more esoteric, Christian teaching, for instance, this Sorta cross is associated with Mary Magdalene. The other cross, the St George cross or Red Cross, is the masculine one and it's seen as more fixed because the equinoxes and solstices can be defined very, very accurately as the time of the year and it's also where the energy of that seasonal quarter is, is, is at its maximum power. So that marks the masculine cross. So you've got the male cross and the female cross um, coming together in this mandala, making love, as it were, and creating the third principle, 
which is their child of light, which is the whole looming consciousness that this mandala will become and will produce in those who make it. These four stages also show the process that we're going through. So that this winter season or north, northern quarter is the preparation time. Then we go into the spring or eastern quarter. This is laying out the foundations. And now we're working with the southern quarter, which is the uh, summertime and the, the beautifying um, process. When we come to the last quarter, the fourth quarter, which is associated with the autumn season, that, that is the time when the whole mandala becomes useful and you put into action. Um, but I'll come to that later when we reach that moment. There's a lovely Greek myth associated with, with this. And that is the myth of Demeter, Persephone and Dionysus. Demeter is the great goddess who represents the foundation of the universe. She is, she is the Divine Mother. She has a child, Persephone. Persephone is a symbol of the human soul who can do whatever she wants. And uh, she's known as the Flower Maiden and she represents the beauty, the, the beautifying of everything. So Demeter gives birth to Persephone. Persephone then gives birth to Dionysus who represents the final stage of the mandala. Dionysus is the child of joy, the child of light. So Demeter, Persephone, Dionysus. And this is another way of telling us how the life process works. The life process works from impulse, the first quarter, to desire, to thought, to action. And raised up to a level of goodness or initiation, the impulse leads to a desire which is loving, loving kindness, which is what freedom means. And then goes into understanding because your thoughts then are thinking about love, which is the truth. And so you develop a true understanding. And then when you put that love and understanding into action, it becomes of service to all life, which is the true meaning of charity. Service comes from a Sanskrit word that means to cherish. So service is cherishing all life. Uh, love in action. Um, the, the Christian formula for this that St. Paul gives is faith, hope, charity, love, understanding, service, faith, hope, charity. These three manifest the, the goodness of the divine. So now we'll carry on with the beautifying. And in this instance, we're going to um, give an emphasis to the, the basic pattern of the foundation. But, but the, there are other ways of doing this in, in a free way. One can cover it up quite a lot. But really the idea is to make what's called the veil, where you both conceal and reveal. Just like choosing beautiful clothes for yourself. You, you conceal your nakedness, but you don't completely disguise it. You try to enhance the nature that you, you, you have. And this is the idea of the beautifying. You are concealing, but you're also revealing at the same time and bring out secrets that might not otherwise have ever been known. As I say, you certainly don't have to do exactly like we're doing. This is just an example purposely selected just for making it easy to teach and for you to see the idea of the mandala or wheel of life.
we're at the moment marking the circle, but you don't have to mark the circle. But we've chosen to do the so this time. Very often when people are working together in this way to beautifying and they've really tuned into something, they, they might put down a symbol that's really personal to them in a particular place in this mandala, which marks something important in terms of their life cycle or the time of the year. You might mark, especially mark the time of the year that you're making this mandala. You might mark your birthday time or you might mark something else in a bigger time cycle because the whole circle can represent your complete life. Or it can mark the initiatory cycle which is associated with the cycles of Saturn. So each one of these one-eighth segments of the circle is a seven-year period in your life. So when you get round, you're born at, in the north symbolically associated with Christmas. Um, you're seven years old here in the northeast. You're 14 here in, in, the, um, in the East Point, spring equinox. Here, here you're um, 21, and when you get round to the south, you're 28, uh, round about the time of your Saturn return. Completely all the way around is your 56 cycle, and then you start a second cycle if you're still living in your physical body, and then you have, a, as it were, a second chance at life to make it even greater with the wisdom you've learned in the first cycle. So you might just mark intuitively without consciously being aware of it, a magic point in that life cycle of, of yours. This is just some of the things I've observed in doing these workshops for over 30 years, celebrating festivals for over 30 years in this way. So there we have beautified our mandala and we've agreed here this is as much as we want to do so we stop and then as soon as we stopped then automatically the last part of making this ma mandala begins and it usually begins with oh aha I like it <laughs> it starts to bring joy so we're going to add to that by lighting the four candles of the quarter directions. So again, it's quite good to do things not haphazardly, but in a ritualistic way. So we're doing it here, going round the circle sunwise as the sun moves. And there we have our beautiful mandala. And sometimes it's enough just to enjoy it. The beauty produces joy. That's the Dionysus, Persephone's child Dionysus, this joy. And joy is an energy. Joy is something we can share with each other. One of the greatest gifts you can give to somebody else is to enjoy them. Enjoy their presence, enjoy who they are. Everybody likes to be enjoyed. And as soon as somebody is enjoyed, they go into a state of joy and they give joy back. Joy is the most infectious thing on earth, in fact, um, and it's the most wonderful thing. And true joy produces an experience of light, which is called illumination. We actually learn then and know what it is to love each other and to be in love and to appreciate the beauty and wonder of the universe. So that can be enough at this stage. But one can take that further. One can use that energy that's generated to, to send out specific thoughts of healing, send out that energy of love and joy into the world or to certain people you know 
who might want help or healing in that way. Or we can carry on celebrating the festival with, with songs, dances and so on. All sorts of things you can actually do in this final stage to keep giving out or sharing that light of joy with everyone and everything. Finally though, the moment comes when that action has ended, the festival point has ended. This means that we've reached this northwest point on the mandala, which marks the end point. It's the festival of peace or festival of death, when we give thanks and we remember. And this, this is a very good teaching, is that you can only give thanks when you remember uh, what you've done during the year and who's been with you, uh, who's helped you or who's tested you and so on. So you give thanks to every person and everything you can remember. So it's a feast of thanksgiving and remembrance. And that brings a knowledge. You then know whether you've done something well or not done something well. And if you've done something well, you then know something of truth. And that brings that wonderful experience of hearing the inner voice saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that brings the real joy, which is enlightening. You know the truth, or at least that little parcel of it that you've been involved with. And then with that, there's a time of peace until the midwinter point when the next impulse begins. So going from one thing to another, allow that time of peace or rest just to remember, give thanks, allow yourself to reach that illumination or that wis have that wisdom before rushing into the next cycle. So with the mandala, when we finished its purpose, the thing is to give thanks, to remember the process and the experience you've had, thank each other, and then to dissolve the mandala. It's, it's done its work. One should always dissolve any form that one's created when it's finished its useful life. And by dissolving it, you have uh, the idea is to remember what you put down, pick up what you have per personally have put down, give thanks to it as you pick it up and dissolve the form of the mandala that way. It's a little teaching about karma. We're each responsible for our own things that we do. So we might litter the universe with our thoughts or whatever. It's our job to go and pick them up eventually so nobody else will do it for us. So we're each responsible for our own karma, good or bad. So it's, that's a little teaching that's involved with dissolving the mandala. Before we dissolve the mandala, I'd like to just mention a few more things about this wheel of life or mandala. It's, it's a huge teaching. It, it's said to contain all wisdom, which I th completely believe. And I've been studying it for a long time, working with it for a long time. And every time I learn something more, it's like an oracle. It's always teaching, teaching, teaching. But I'd like to point out more about this as representing a time cycle. Now, in terms of an annual cycle of time, the, the year that we go through, these eight main points are the power points of the year. They're very important moments. They govern, it's, a, it's, it's expressing a law that governs nature, um, and it also governs our lives, if only we were more aware of it. The more aware of it we become, the more we can work with it, and the more we then become in harmony with the cosmos and with nature, and the more creative and fulfilled we can become as a result. This north point is the marking midwinter, midwinter and Christmas. Midwinter is round about the 22nd of December to the 24th of December. The old way of seeing that time moment is watching the sun when it rises in the morning on the horizon. And at midwinter in the northern hemisphere, the sun will have reached the most southerly point on the horizon that, that it will ever reach. And it will seem to pause there for three days, rising in the same position for three days. That's the solstice. Solstice means sun stands still. Then on the 25th, the sun will have started moving back again towards the north. 
and the, which means the daylight hours will have started to get longer again. So you're moving out of the darkest moment of the year, starting to move eventually towards the lightest moment. So this is the time birth of light or rebirth of light is celebrated and that's why we have Christmas at that time. It's an older festival than just the Christian church's festival. Christian church festival is simply carrying on the celebration of this very, very important moment in time that, that all our ancestors in all places throughout the world have celebrated for millions of years. It's a great time, great time of the year to celebrate. But then all the festivals are important. The next festival is the end of winter, beginning of summer, associated with the northeast. This, this is the beginning of February. In the Celtic calendar, it's called Imbolc. In the Christian calendar, it's called Candlemas. There's a lot of mythology and stories associated in different cultures with each of these festivals, which I'm not going to give here, to, but, but um, you can find them out or work with us more in Zoans and we'll be able to inform you more about them. Then when we come to the East Point, that's in the annual cycle, that's the festival of the spring equinox. Um, an old name for this was Easter, because it celebrated the goddess Easter, who became pregnant on that day, seeded by, by the light of God, by, by the spiritual sun. So that was the moment of her conceiving the child, and then nine months later, at Christmas, she gave birth to that child. So the Christianity took that name of the goddess Easter, the name of that festival, and applied it to the Christian festival of the resurrection of Jesus, which actually is more of a full moon festival rather than to do with the solar festivals of a year. Then we come to the End of, end of the spring, beginning of summer, associated with the southeast point in the calendar of the year, that's the beginning of May, when the May Day Festival takes place. The Celtic name was Beltane, and the tradition was to light two fires and dance between them and drive your cattle and other animals between those two fires, representing marrying the two polarities together. It was also the day when the marriages took place. So at the spring equinox, you made love, or you found your lover, um, and then you got married at, at, at the May Day, the great May Day festival. I mean, not that, not that that's exactly done nowadays, but there were times when this was a great communal time for marriage. Then you come to midsummer, midsummer solstice. Again, the sun appears to stand still, but this time in the Northern Hemisphere, it stands still in the most northerly position it will ever reach on the horizon for three days and then it starts to um, move further southwards and the days start to grow shorter. The Midsummer Day itself is, is associated with St John the Baptist, whereas the um, midwinter point is associated with the birth of Jesus but also associated with the feast day of St John the Divine or Beloved. So in Freemasonry and other cultures, the two Johns represented the two poles of the year, midwinter and midsummer, which are also associated with north and south poles of the earth itself, and in our body with the crown and root chakras of our body. But this is just giving you signposts to much, much deeper wisdom that one can unlock and delve into with the, with the help of the mandala. Then we come round to the south, West Point, associated in the annual cycle with the end of summer, beginning of autumn. This is celebrated by the festival of Lunasa or Lamas. Lamas is the name of the bread that's made from the first cutting of the harvest, cutting the wheat in the field. The first, first cut is dedicated to God. A loaf of bread is made out of it and offered to God before the main harvest, which then is celebrated at the mid-autumn time, which is the autumn equinox, around about September the 22nd to 24th. That's the main harvest festival of the year. Then we come to the end of autumn, beginning of winter, and this really is the end of the unfolding cycle, and it, and it descends into winter and the, and the time of rest. 
of, of waiting for the new cycle to begin. And this, as I mentioned before, this is the festival of thanksgiving and remembrance, and the Celtic name for this is Samhain, when you light your fire of peace. In old European traditions, this is the time when on the bonfire you would put the guy. Now the guy is a symbol of your old self, and so you, you pick some old clothes you don't want anymore, you say thank you to them because they've been useful to you, you stuff it with the, the straw, um, that's, that's the remainder of the harvest, um, which needs, needs to be recycled uh, back into the ground. You paint a mask for a face which represents your old self, which you want to now say, thank you, goodbye, I don't need you anymore. And then you burn that guy on the bonfire and celebrate the new birth that's soon going to take place in six weeks' time of, of your new self in the new cycle. To do this is actually really good psychology. Makes you think about yourself in that last year, um, how you are, your good, good aspects, your bad aspects, the things that you want to give up, uh, release, in order to allow you, yourself more freedom to go into the new cycle in a better way. Great celebration to do at this point. The other thing I want to mention about this, we, we've created this mandala in two dimensions, seemingly. But, it, but whenever we do this, we're actually creating something in three dimensions as well. To create the two dimensions automatically produces the third dimension. So it's not just a, a circle of energy, it's, it's also a sphere of energy. It's not just a square of energy, it's also a cube of energy. So we've created a complete three-dimensional temple in terms of, of a subtle energy or thought form um, that is a cube cubing the sphere, cube of the earth, cubing the sphere of the spirit, spirit and matter coming together in perfect harmony and marriage, and that produces the light of the true soul, which shines like a sun. So if we do this well, with love, out of love, and create this world, this is what we actually produce, the shining sun of light, which then can be useful in, in sending its light around the world to help and to heal and to uplift and to bless. In terms of our life process, this is a wonderful help in trying to understand how the life process works and how we can enhance it and um, reduce the number of mistakes we make. We learn, of course, through mistakes, but the idea is to make less mistakes as we go on in life and gradually becoming true initiates and adepts at, at living life on earth. So to go through the four quarters again, as in terms of life process, this north quarter is the impulse, then the east quarter is the desire, then the thought, then the action. As we go into what's called initiation, we learn to love, learn to understand, learn to serve, and then the impulses become inspirational ones. We, we start to get inspired um, but by the divinity of life, but by good things. And so our loving increases, our understanding increases, and our service, our capacity to be charitable or altruistic increases enormously in power and our abilities. To switch from one part to another, we have to cross these quarter day points, quarter days in the cycle of life uh, in terms of time. These are known as the gateways, the gateways from one part of the cycle into the next. And associated with these gateways are great thoughts or ideas of God known, known as uh, the great angels or cherubim. So there is a cherubim for each of these quarter directions, marking moving from one quarter into another quarter. So they're there in terms of time cycle and they're there in terms of our life process. They're known as the cherubim that guard the gates of paradise. Paradise is from a Hebrew word spelt with four letters, P-R-D-S, P-R-D-S. So to get into paradise, which means completing that word, you have to pass each of these gateways. 
So from P to R is the first gateway, from R to uh, D is the second gateway, from D to S is the third gateway, and then when you've finished that S, the fourth gateway takes you fully into paradise, which is the state of illumination, the state of true peace and joy. And this we do through the life process. The impulse, loving, understanding, service, illumination, which is, which is the light. The first gateway to remember in terms of our life process is the dedication. So as soon as you feel a desire, which is your will, I want something, dedicate it to something good. You may not know what that action's going to finally be, but you've got this desire for doing something, dedicate it. And that immediately sifts out those more selfish desires, so that you only have a really good desire that then grows in intensity as you allow that desire to expand. That desire is an emotion, and its counterpart is feeling. So as your emotional desire grows in that good way, loving way, it opens your intuitive nature. You become more intuitive, and you start to hear that desire, which is a force and, and a vibration, actually speaking to you. And it speaks to your mind in the throat. So it opens the heart here, opens the throat chakra, and now your mind, focused in the head, is hearing it at this point. You hear the inner voice speaking to you, suggesting to you an idea of something to do. At this point, you'll immediately have a second voice coming up to counteract the first voice. So you might have a suggestion like, why don't you go and um, fly off, the, off that cliff? And the other voice comes up and says, oh, don't be so silly, that'd be a stupid thing to do. And then it starts the process of thinking because uh, all thinking is based on comparing one thing with another. So then you have to decide whether the first voice you heard was a true voice or whether it's a deceiving voice. Then you make the choice as to which voice you listen to. And then you develop your, your understanding about that idea suggested to you, building up the vision and then working out how to put it into action until finally you're ready to put your idea into action. And then you're at the third power point here, associated with the southwest. This is the third cherub. And this is the moment to pause. Pause a moment before you rush into action. In the Shakespeare play of The Merchant of Venice, this moment is pointed out by Portia when um, Shylock is wanting to plunge his dagger into Antonia's breast. At the, just before Shylock does this and, and of course, kills Antonio, Portia cries out, wait a moment, haven't you forgotten something? And of course, what's been forgotten changes the whole scenario. And very often we will rush into action thinking we've got a really good idea, but we haven't actually thought it out well enough. We rush into action, we make a big mistake, and then we wonder why it's gone wrong, because we had good intentions. Well, this third PowerPoint is a wonderful thing to remember. Just pause, offer up your idea to God, to the Most High, or, or to whatever you want to offer it to, and say, is this really a good idea? And wait for the answer. If the answer is, no, not really, then it gives you a chance to think again, think some more about it until you've got it right. But if the answer is, yes, go for it, then it actually gives you not just permission, but it actually empowers you and gives you more courage if it's a difficult thing to do, gives you more courage to carry it out. Great PowerPoint. Well, they're all great PowerPoints. And then when you come to the final gateway, this is the moment to give thanks and to remember. If you don't give thanks, not only is it rude and, and selfish, thoughtless, you also miss the opportunity to reach enlightenment, because you don't reach enlightenment unless you give thanks and remember at the same time. And you reach enlightenment because you remember that you've done something really well, and you realise why you've done it well, you've learnt something of truth, and you hear the inner voice saying to you, well done, my good and faithful servant, and that brings the joy with the knowledge. And that joy and knowledge is what's called enlightenment, it lights us up, it actually builds eventually builds bit by bit what's called our light body, which is our immortal body, our immortal body of our true soul. Everything else is mortal, 
but the immortal body of light is truly immortal and it simply grows, grows, grows throughout these cycles of time until it can fill the universe, being at one with all other illumined souls in one great glorious consciousness of love and joy, knowing all things. So don't miss this PowerPoint. In fact, don't miss any of the PowerPoints because <laughs> they're all key and they will help your whole life process so that you become a true initiate or yogi and, and find that joy of life. Nobody can take that away from you once you've achieved it. It simply grows. So now we come to the moment when we dissolve the mandala. The teaching is this. We each have to take up what we've put down. It teaches us various things and one of them is about karma. We're each responsible for our own karma. Karma, it can be good or bad, but whatever it is, we're each responsible for clearing it up. Whatever we've produced has, has finished its useful life. And as we pick it up, we of course remember, first of all, we've got to remember what you put down, which is sometimes more difficult than others. And as you pick it up, just thank it and gradually dissolve the form. So the, the space is left for something new to be born in it. So we don't leave litter around, as it were, um, in the universe. Before we take the various bits away, we'll blow out the candlelight. Now we find it really useful to make use of everything. So as we blow this candlelight out, we like imagine that we're sending the light of our hearts out to somebody or something in the world who needs help or healing or some upliftment of some kind. And so what we do is we take time, a moment to think who we want to send it to. Then we visualize them and holding that vision of that personal place, we send them light. One, two, three. And then together we blow out the center candle. So for light in the world, one, two, three. And then we dissolve the mandala. And then finally, the centerpiece, with great thanks and love to everyone and the whole of nature and the spiritual world. Thank you. Amen. <laughs>